Good morning. Good to see you. So I know a lot of you, some of you I don't. I don't and, um, I'm glad to see those of you I don't because it means you're growing. God is doing something here. Um, I'm Jason Keel. Uh, we are one of your supported missionaries. Um, what my job is, I get to go from church to church and in communities to teaching people how to share their faith and how to share their story. Uh, and what I hope is that God will multiply his church through my efforts and then through your efforts uh, as well. Um, and so when Matt said, I'm doing this sermon series, I want you to do this one week on sharing. Can you share your story, Jason? And I was like, yeah, that's great. Like, I, I, can I share with them how to tell their story? And he was like, yeah. So today what I'm going to do is something a little unusual for a sermon. Um, I'm going to share my story with you about how I came to faith with Jesus. But what I also want to do is equip you and give you some tools that you can use to go and share your story, where you live, where you work, with people you love, and with people you don't love, uh, both. And so uh, here's my story. Growing up, my family was at church three times a week. I was there on Sunday morning, I was there on Sunday night, and I was typically there on Wednesday nights. Uh, I was in choir, vacation Bible school, youth group. Our church had a sports league I played softball and basketball in. At Sunday morning services every single week. Um, but my, and my parents, they loved Jesus. Um, and the reason we were there so often is they really wanted us to hear the gospel, and they wanted us to love Jesus as well. I have two brothers. Um, but with all those opportunities, somehow I missed it. Um, I just didn't really get the gospel. I didn't really get what it meant to follow Jesus. I believed in God. I believe in Jesus after a fashion, but my life was mine, and it didn't belong to anybody else. And so in my adolescence, just like a lot of adolescents, 12, 13, 14 years old and on, I was super insecure, but I faked it really well. Um, I wasn't confident in my looks. I wasn't confident in my thinking ability and my intelligence. I wasn't confident in school and athletics. I mean, I just had this lack of self-confidence. I was looking for something to fill me up, but I didn't know what that something was. Uh, I was actually a leader in my church youth group, uh, but I didn't really get it. Uh, there was there's something, there wasn't anything personal about my relationship with God. It was just something I did and something that I believed in on, on a head level. Um, I was a decent student. I, I made decent grades, but I did not excel at math or science. Uh, in fact, I didn't make the honor society because of math and science. That's the only reason. Uh, I was a leader at church, but there wasn't anything about my relationship with God that, like, went deeper than just going. Uh, I was a decent uh, athlete, uh, but, like, I had a surprising number of guys on my football team and on my baseball team who played college baseball and, call and, and NFL and, uh, football as well. Uh, and so, I mean, I was okay, uh, but I, I just didn't excel in comparison to the other people around me. I was absolutely girl crazy when I was a teenager. But I was so painfully shy about, around girls that I couldn't, like, get a deep enough relationship with a girl, like, where she would even notice that I was there. So, like, if I asked her out, she'd kind of like, who are you? And so, I mean, that was just like, ah, come on. And so I, football was kind of an idol for me. I was on the football team. One reason I was on, besides I liked it. It was really fun. But the other reason was I thought, okay, if I'm a standout on the football team, then, you know, maybe the girls will notice me. And then, I, you know, all my other problems will go away, which is dumb and naive. But, you know, I was, I was a teenager. Uh, and sometimes teenagers have some interesting ideas. Um, this one year, like when I was a junior in high school, I was on the football team. And I'm from South Alabama. Uh, it's like South Georgia. Gnats, heat, cotton, peanuts, same thing. Um, but it's just further west. That's the only difference. Um, and we had two-a-day football practices in August before school started. So you had to just show up at 6 o'clock in the morning, and you'd stay till about 8. And then you would show up again at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and you'd stay till about 7. And it was like that every, for two weeks in a row. And it was exceptionally hot this year when I was 17, when I was 16. I was a junior in high school. Um, and one morning during two-a-days, I woke up with a fever. Very slight, but it was definitely a fever. Um, and so I had made a decision. I was desperate to get more playing time. I really wanted to play, and I wanted to impress my coach. So I didn't tell my parents, didn't tell anybody. I just got in my car at 6, and I drove over to the school, and I went to practice. And then I came home, and I felt awful, just terrible. But that afternoon, I made the same decision. I want to play. I want to impress the coach. So I went back. 
Um, and I just, I don't even remember the practice. I don't, I don't remember my, much what happened to anything that day. But after practice, my teammates found me, and I was lost between the, the practice field and the locker room. And it wasn't that far to get to, kind of walking in circles. So some of my teammates they guided me into the locker room, and immediately they tell me I collapsed and I began to convulse. And so they dragged me into the shower room, and they went and got ice, and they packed me in ice. And that's what's happening on the outside. What's happening inside here is I was falling. I felt this falling sensation. Everything's black all around me. There's people screaming in terror everywhere all around me. And there's this voice, kind of like Dr. Claw from Inspector Gadget. Oh, 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 oh. You know, that like, like Job of the Hut or something. I and mean, it was like, you're going to hell. And I mean, I was, I was so devastatingly terrified. And it just seemed like this went on forever. It was like one of those dreams. I don't know if you've ever had one of these dreams where you dream that you're falling. And then sometime while you're asleep, you actually kind of sit up. And then when you wake up, you hit the pillow. Has that ever happened to any of you? It was like that, but it never stopped. And so just as I thought I was going to go crazy, this little voice in my right ear said, if you tell Coach Ryan about Jesus, I'll let you go. And I was like, yes, whatever. I Just let me out of here. And as soon as I said, whatever, let me out of here, I woke up. And I was on the floor of the locker room, and I had three linemen holding me down. And I was covered in ice. And my head coach is, le- is like bending over me. And so just imagine from his perspective, I'm having a seizure, I'm shaking, and my eyes pop open, and I sit up, and I grab him by the front of the shirt, and I pull his nose to mine, and I said, go get Coach Ryan. And he ran out of that room. He didn't say anything. He just ran. He came running back with Coach Ryan. Coach Ryan was our strength coach. He looked like He-Man. He's not someone you want to touch in a way that makes him uncomfortable, okay? He's scary. Coach Ryan kneels down beside me. I grab Coach Ryan by the front of his shirt. I pull him nose to nose, and I say, Coach Ryan, do you know Jesus? And he goes, what? Do you know Jesus, yes or no? Yeah, Keel, I know Jesus. Calm down. I know Jesus. It's okay. And I was like, all right, thank you. And I just lay back in the ice. I was like, my job is done here. <laughs> so at that, just about that time, these two paramedics came in with my dad. And the paramedics put me on a gurney, and they took me to the hospital. And on, on, in the ambulance on the way, they pumped four quarts of electrolytes into me. And I had a 108-degree temperature. Uh, that's right on the edge of brain damage, in case you don't know. They saved my life. My teammates saved my life. My coaches saved my life. And those paramedics, they saved my life. And the one good immediate thing that came out of it for my football team was that next day, coach immediately doubled the number of water breaks they got. And when I got out of the hospital, I was, I was banished to the sidelines for two or three weeks until I was ready to to enter back into practice. And, but what was going on inside of my head was this battle because I realized something significant just happened. Something I couldn't just explain away, but I did just that because I didn't want to think about it. I didn't want to think about the spiritual implications for what just happened. And so I just told myself, this was a fever dream. I'm a religious guy. I'll clean up my act. It'll be fine. And that's what I did. I spent the rest of high school kind of easing myself out of the party lifestyle that I was in. You know, that was another way I tried to fill the void. Um, But it wasn't as good after that. Um, I knew something happened, but it didn't make any kind of big decision. Now, I told you earlier that my best friends all played, they all played at college and college baseball and football, and some of them went to the NFL. So naturally, they left this little town that I'm from, and I'm alone at home, and I fell back on my church as my community. Um, And I became a youth counselor for the junior high youth program. Um, And so in October of 1992, the uh, youth director and I, we went and took the the kids to this place called the Judgment House. Uh, Yeah. It's just like it sounds. It's scary. It's a, it's a Christian haunted house, okay? Uh, so you know, just a disclaimer, it worked for me, okay? I'm not sure that Bridgepoint should hold a judgment house, but, I mean, uh, y'all follow the spirit, and, and you can assess that yourselves. 
Here's what happens. So that you go, there's like three or four big rooms in this warehouse. And the first room is a, there's this couple and the guy goes up to a, like they built the front side of a house. He goes up to the front door, he picks up his date. They, you know, like, and then they go get in the car. And so then you walk out into the next room and then there's a burning car in the next room. And you see them like, there's, there's obviously dead people laying there, you know, but they're covered up. It's not gory or anything, but you know, you know what happened. There was a car wreck. Uh, and then the next room you go into is like a courtroom kind of place, like an angelic, heavenly courtroom. And so what happens is you walk in and you see the girl there and you see the guy there. And so the, the judge behind the, the seat, he's sitting on the seat up top. He says, please step forward. And so she says, he says to her, why should I let you into heaven? And she says, well, you shouldn't. But Jesus is my savior. And he's paid for my sins. And the guy, you know, this music goes, oh like that and there's a gate off to the right and the gate opens and she walks through the gate and so then her boy, boyfriend date whatever walks up to the front and what he does is she does he does the same thing he's like why should I let you into heaven and this guy looked him straight in the eye and said well I don't drink and I don't smoke and I don't cuss and I'm a good I'm a person and I try to keep the ten commandments and I go to church and the judge says son I'm sorry that's that's not required for entrance and so these two guys who we didn't see who were standing behind us dressed in very dark clothes, they come and grab him and they drag him through a door. And so we go through this door, this group of us, and we get in this door. We have to hold hands. It's really dark. And Dr. Claw is in there. He's laughing. And there's people screaming all around me. The only thing that's different about my dream that I had is that I'm not falling. That's the only difference. And I was, I was terrified. It was, I'm holding people's hands on either side, and I can feel them start to pull on my hands because I'm squeezing them so hard. I was hurting them. But we, it seemed like we were in there forever. And so finally, when we go out the other side, there's these people out there, and they want to talk to me about how to have a relationship with Jesus. And I'm like, no, I don't want to talk about that. I'm scared to death. I'm going home. So I leave these youth that I'm with, and I go to the youth pastor, and I said, I'm going home. And he was like, but you brought five kids with you. You got to take them home. I said, I don't care. I'm going home. So I left him. I don't know how they got home. I got in my car. I drove home. I walked into my parents' bedroom. They're sitting there talking. I burst out. I think if I died today, I would go to hell. And my parents were like, what? I totally had them fooled. I was living a complete double life. They, they, they didn't know. And my mom says, what happened? And I said, I just said it again. And so my, then my dad was like, uh, uh, you know, completely at a loss. And then they both said to me, well, go to your room and pray and think, and we'll, we'll be with you in a minute. So I go to my room, I get down on my knees, and begin to pray. I'm really scared. And then I hear this, this noise at my door. My mom slips this note underneath my door. Uh, and she said a lot in that note, but this is the part I want to read you a section. I pulled it out of my diary just last week as I was preparing. She wrote this to me. Uh, this was on October 25th, 1992, 29 years ago. Um, if you sincerely believe you haven't ever been sincere when you ask the Lord to be your personal savior, then ask him to take control of your life now. She underlines this. Give yourself to the Lord now. Once you do, underline, believe, you are saved, underlined, by grace, underlined. And don't ever doubt it. So that's what I did. On my knees, I told the Lord, I, I am yours. I'm afraid. Um, I can't do it. Please be my Savior. And so I gave my life to the Lord that night. So after that, my life didn't immediately become easier. Uh, I didn't get rich. You know, I didn't all of a sudden get all the dates. I had none of all this stuff that I wanted that happened. But one big thing did happen that I think was the key that stood, or the wall that stood between me and Jesus. My insecurity and my need for approval from other people immediately began to go away, immediately. It was amazing. God showed me that he was enough and he still is today. He can be enough for you too if you give yourself wholly, with a W, to Jesus. So that's my story. Um, there are lots of different ways to tell your story. My story is kind of long, as you've noticed. It's kind of weird. 
it's not a normal kind of story, and I don't normally tell it. So, I, like in the first service when I told this story, all these people who I know came to me going, I didn't know that. That's because this is not something that I normally tell. But prayerfully, as I was considering what story to tell, it seemed like this was the one to tell you. Um, but there's mo even more to it that I left out um, that this venue is just not appropriate for. Uh, so I prayerfully chose this. And I think the details that I shared today for you, for whatever reason, they matter. Um, and that's what the longer version of my story gives you. But one thing I didn't tell you in this version is how you could become a Christian in a way that's really, like, um, brief but clear. Um, I used some churchy language in the middle of there, if you noticed. And so because you, many of you go to church every week, you got it. But there may be some others of you who are like, I'm not sure about this grace and saved, saved from what, and that kind of stuff. Um, so, but if you want to know, if you don't know how to start up a personal relationship with God and, and be, quote, unquote, saved from your sins, hang on. I will tell you in a few minutes. There have been other times when I've had a chance to tell my story that called for a shorter version that honed in on some different aspects of my life that was tailored for that person in the time where they were. Um, and you can do that too. In fact, that's not marketing or sales. That, the Bible does it too. Try reading the Gospels sometime. You read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you're gonna see some stories that are the same, but they're in different order. You're gonna be some stories that are the same, but they have slightly different details. You're gonna have other stories that are missing from one Gospel, but, but, but present in another one. Why is that? It's because Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John had an audience they were thinking about that they want to convey the story of Jesus to, and they told it in such a way that it would touch that audience and answer questions they had. Um, they were simply following something that John, Jesus' best friend, who was one of the early church leaders, said. He wrote this in the very last chapter of his gospel. He says, there are also many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose the world itself cannot contain the books that would be written. Your story is similar, that you could spend all day talking about your story, but there are moments when certain parts of your story need to be, need to be told for the encouragement of someone else. Uh, let me illustrate how this would work, okay? Uh, a few years back, I received a Facebook friend request from a woman who was a teenager at the time and when I was a teenager. We lived on the same street during high school, and I didn't really know her very well, but she asked me to be her Facebook friend, and I was like, oh, fine, okay. And over time, we would like uh, interact on various things, and I try to be encouraging to her, her because based off of her Facebook news feed, she was having a difficult time. Um, and about a year and a half ago, sometime during 2020, maybe a little bit before the pandemic started, um, she was going through a terrible thing. And I, I won't want to tell you what it was. It's, it's, it's none of my business to tell you, but, but I can just tell you it was bad. Um, and she wrote this on her Facebook news feed one day as I was perusing, I read it. It says, how do y'all build up your confidence? I'm, pretty, I'm at a pretty low place right now. And that was an understatement. So I, as I began to read the comments underneath that, I saw a lot of stuff like this. Girl, you're great. You're beautiful. Um, you know, you are special. You have a lot to offer the world. You know, positive, good things. But I don't think they were quite getting at where her deep problem lay, at least based on a Christian worldview. And so I decided not to, to, to write something long in the comments. Instead, I wrote her a, a note on Facebook Messenger. And what I'd like to do is I want to I read you that message that I sent her. Um, it's, real, it's real brief, and it's another version of the story I just told you. It's, not, it's only different in some of the details I chose to share. Let me read it to you, okay? So I'm going to be looking down. Um, I saw your post about building up your confidence, and it got me thinking about my own journey in this area. So rather than share on the comments, I thought I'd write you a message instead. I suffered from terrible insecurities until I was in college. And when I was 18, my life changed. Rather than tell you the whole story, I'll just tell you what changed. Before I was 18, I looked for significance and accomplishment and approval. I was involved in a ton of stuff, was decently successful at a lot of things, but I was not a standout or a star in anything. So that was a dead end. I looked for significance in relationships and popularity, but while I had a lot of friends and was pretty well liked, I was not the most popular. In fact, I felt empty pursuing the approval of others and it led me into some situations where I did some pretty dumb stuff that I regret. I lied to and hurt people I love in pursuit of approval. And that was a dead end too. When I was 18, I started to internalize this good news and it changed my life. 
I'm going to take an aside here. This is where I'm going to share the gospel. Okay, so if you don't know the good news about how to be saved, listen very carefully. Before the world began, God looked down through history at me, mediocre, wayward, lying me, and he decided that he loved me. He saw the lies, the hypocrisy, and the fact that I didn't pay him much attention at all, all of which the Bible calls sin, and put in place an elaborate plan to bring me to himself. So he became a man, lived the life I should have lived, and died a death that sinners like me deserve. He did that because he loves me. All I had to do was accept that love and start living with him. So that's what I did. Ever since then, whenever I'm tempted to put my confidence and trust in things, people, fallible self, or other stuff that failed me in the past, I remember that my freedom from self-doubt and my slavery to desires I can't fulfill was paid for by someone who loves me more than I can possibly imagine. That person is Jesus. He's the source of my confidence, and he can be that source for anyone, including you. That's my story in a nutshell. I hope you find it helpful. Please let me know how I can be help and praying for you. That, was, yeah, that took me about three minutes to read. It was less than 300 words long, um, and it was simple. See, here's the problem I think that a lot of us face. I used to as well. We think we're scared to share our, our, our story about coming to faith or our, our, what our relationship with Jesus is. And we think we have to have some wild story full of death and miracles in order for it, people to hear it. I don't tell my story, the part that I told you first, because of that. Because I don't want people to, to like hone in on the miracles and the death and all that stuff. What I want them to see is Jesus, but there are times when it's appropriate to say it, and I chose that to say to you today. Um, that's exactly what our enemy wants us to think. My story is not just exciting enough to tell. That's not true. Absolutely not. That is a lie from the pit of hell. There's much more to my story, but in that moment, my high school classmate needed to know that there was someone with a capital S who, was, who I based my hope and my confidence in, someone who would never let her down. Um, she also needed to hear the gospel really clearly because she didn't know it. She was very appreciative. She did not accept Christ in that Facebook messenger exchange we had, but the conversation continues. And based off what I hear from other people and what I see and from a distance, she's taking steps. She's, she's, she may not know it yet, but she's moving closer to him. Uh, and I see it happening. I was saved over time. That, that was my moment. But over time, I had people in my life who shared their stories with me. Many of you have heard someone share their story with, with you, and it just drew you closer to God. Stories are powerful. The Bible is full of them. Why is that? Well, I think that apart from the gospel itself, your story is one of the most powerful tools that God uses to bring people to himself. A huge chunk of the Bible proves this. You can see it happening in there. In fact, there are examples of people telling their stories in the Bible in front of big groups of people, just like I'm doing right now. And I want to go to one of those right now. And I'll, so if you will, if you turn with me to Acts chapter 22, uh, if you're unfamiliar with the Bible, it's in the uh, like last quarter of the Bible called the New Testament. It is the fifth book in. Uh, and if you're on your phone, just A-C-T-S. There you go. That's, that's how you find it. Acts chapter 22, verses 1 through 21. Uh, rather than, like, try to recap the story for you, uh, I'll, I'll just read you this guy's story. To catch you up, it's a story told by the Apostle Paul, one of the guys who wrote most of the New Testament. He was a missionary. He was a writer. He was a pastor. And over the years, he made lots of enemies among the, the elite of the Jewish um, religious establishment, and one time he was worshiping in the temple in Jerusalem, and some of those guys who were his enemies saw him, and they yelled this out to the crowd. They said, men of Israel, help. This is the man who's teaching everyone everywhere against the people and the law in this place. Moreover, he, can, he even brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. Well, as soon as they screamed that out, people stopped praying. They started turning around, and a riot broke out because that was like a deadly offense. People were willing to kill over how holy the temple was supposed to be. And so all these people began to run at Paul, and they were going to try to kill him. And there was all a bunch of other people who was like, who's Paul? What's going on? And so they, this, this riot breaks out. 
the, well, the, one of the things the Romans hate the most is riots. So immediately the Roman soldiers came out of the barracks and came running to the temple. They found Paul and they arrested him. And then because they arrested him, they saved his life because those people were about to rip him limb from limb. They drag him to the local barracks where the Romans lived. And on the steps of the barracks, Paul says, hey, can I address the crowd just like to tell them like my side of the story? And so whoever was in charge of that group decided, yeah, sure, go ahead. So he turns around and there's this crowd that's screaming for his blood, but he tells them this story, his story of coming to faith in Jesus. So here we go, starting in verse one. Brothers and fathers, hear the defense that I now make before you. And when they heard that he was addressing them in Hebrew, so he's speaking their own language, they became even more quiet. And he said, I am a Jew born in Tarsus in Cilicia, but brought up in this city, educated at the feet of Gamaliel, a really famous and conservative Bible teacher. Uh, according to the strict manner of the law of our fathers, being zealous for God, as all of you are this day, I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering to prison both men and women, as the high priest and the whole council of elders can bear me witness. From them I received letters to the brothers, and I journeyed toward Damascus to take those who also were there and bring them in bonds to Jerusalem to be punished. I was, as I was on my way and drew near to Damascus about noon, a great light from heaven suddenly shone around me, and I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I'm Jesus of Nazareth, whom, you pers whom you're persecuting. Now, those who were with me saw the light, but they did not understand the voice of the one who was speaking to me. And I said, what shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, rise and go into Damascus, and there you will be told all that is appointed for you to do. And since I could not see because of the brightness of that light, I was led by the hand by those who were with me and came into Damascus. And one, Ananias, a devout man according to the law, well spoken of by all the Jews who lived there, came to me and standing by me said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And then at that very hour, I received my sight and saw him. And he said, the God of our fathers appointed you to know his will, to see the righteous one and to hear a voice from his mouth. For you will be a witness for him to everyone who, of what you have seen and heard. And now, why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. And when I had returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple, I fell into a trance and saw him saying to me, make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly because they will not accept your testimony about me. And I said, Lord, they themselves know that in one synagogue after another, I imprisoned and beat those who believed in you. And when the blood of Stephen, your witness was being shed, I myself was standing by and approving and watching over the garments of those who killed him. And he said to me, go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. So Paul shares this story to the crowd. I'll let you, if you want to, after the service, continue your reading to see what happens. But Paul was taking the advice of one of Jesus' other really great friends named Peter. And Peter wrote this in one of his letters, in his first letter to the churches. He says, In your hearts honor Christ, the Lord is holy, always prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and with respect. You see that one of Jesus' first disciples is telling all the people who's reading his letters, be prepared. Tell people why you have hope in Jesus and do it with gentleness and respect. Here's the thing that Peter recognized, that Paul recognized, that Jesus recognized, that I want you to know too. God gave you a story. And believe it or not, there are parts of your story that can relate to people who don't know him, who will know him someday. Here's one other thing. God wants you to tell your story. He really does because he gave you a good story. Doesn't matter if you became a Christian when you were really young and you barely remember. You have a beginning for your story. You have a how you met Jesus. And most importantly, you have a way, a how he changed your life. The effects he's having in your life right now if you're a follower of Jesus. And it's not as hard as you think it is to like organize that story so that it can be short and clear and winsome. So Paul was prepared, just like Peter said, to give a brief account of what he believed in Jesus. And you can be prepared too by following Paul's example. 
So what I did for you this morning is I drew out a how-to guide from Paul's speech that I just read to you. All right, so here's three basic characteristics that everybody needs to share their story effectively. All right, number one, his story was understandable. Notice in the first couple of verses it said he stopped and he switched languages to Hebrew so that everybody in that crowd can understand him easily. All right, so there's this language that Christians speak a lot. It's called Christianese. We say words like grace and faith and saved, and people are like, grace, yeah, like a ballet dancer. No, but it means something else. They saved, saved from what? Faith, yeah, yeah, faith is sort of something I believe with no good reason, but I just do. No, 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 no. But we use them in different ways that don't translate sometimes. So all you gotta do is when you're thinking about how to tell your story, just take the Christianese out. Or if you're gonna use it, like I did, I said the word sin in my short story to my friend, I explained what I meant. All right, that's all you gotta do. Secondly, his account was structured into three parts, three easy to follow parts. The first one was life before Jesus. Then came how he met Jesus. And thirdly, life after Jesus, after you meet Jesus. What kind of changes does that make in your life? And you can tell, you tell your story that way too. That's what I just did twice in front of you. That's what Paul did in his version as well. And the third thing, and this is one of the most important things, is his account was brief, okay? Now, I read this story in about three minutes. Is how long? It, I timed myself the first time I did it. So it's about three minutes. Apart from trying to shush the crowd, Paul probably took three to five minutes too, okay? Um, it's a story of roughly 500 words. I got on BibleGateway.com. I highlighted the whole thing, 500 words, okay? You can do that too. In most situations, a brief version is better than a long version. Why? Well, have you ever had someone who, like, asked you a question and what they were expecting was, like, a three-minute answer and you told this really long story or vice versa? When you ask a question, you're, you're, sure, you're expecting the short answer, and they, tell, they just go on and on and on and on with all the details you don't want to know, and you find yourself doing this the whole time. Ah, yeah, huh? yeah. Because, like, you got somewhere you got to be, you got to go to the bathroom, something like that, okay? So if you, keep, if you can craft ahead of time a 300-word story that you're relatively familiar with, and if they ask you something about your, your faith, you can share your story in three minutes, and then the ball is in their court now. They get to go, wait a second, you, you had a seizure and you saw hell? What? And so then you can take more time. Or, if they, go, they, or they can go, oh, that's nice. How about those braves? You know, either way, the ball is now in their court, and you, but you've done what you could do. Uh, and shorter is always better, okay? Because evangelism, which is a fancy word for sharing your faith, really is a series of conversations over time in context of relationships. There are some times when you can share your faith and people come to Christ like that. It does happen. I've done it before. But it's not normal. Normally, it's just in context of your relationships. So that you're, you're sharing with someone is sharing something that's important to you. It's good for them. It deepens your relationship. And it's going to happen over several conversations, if not more. Okay? And you just want to leave the door open. So if you pa follow Paul's example, you can tell your story effectively when the moment is right. So here's what I want, to, I want to ask you and encourage you to do a couple of things, okay? First, I encourage you to take time to write your story out, maybe as an outline, maybe as a story, whatever works for you, um, and try to keep it within 500 words, right? Then I want you to share it with a friend or with your spouse or someone else who's already a believer. The first thing that that will do is it will encourage them because it's great hearing people's stories. It'll encourage your faith, it'll encourage them. Then you can also give them some pointers about how they could shorten it. I mean, you invite them to do this ahead of time, of course, uh, and, so, and how you can make it better. Um, and so it's gonna help you tell your story so that you're prepared in the moment when you see, oh, this person, this person has the same problem I had. I can, I can tell them my experience. It'll help you to be short and brief and winsome. Second thing I want to ask you to consider doing is, is this. I'd like for you to consider writing a list out of all the people you know who either you know they don't follow Jesus for one reason or another, or you're not sure if they do. And I want you to start praying for them daily. 
uh, put it on a piece of paper, stick it on your notes app on your phone, someplace you will see it every day and pray very briefly for their salvation, for them to become followers of Jesus, to know his love and his acceptance like you do. Start doing that every day. This is both a promise and a warning, okay? If you do that, God is going to bring a a chance for you to share your story with him. It's going to happen. Why? Because he wants everybody to hear his story, and your story is a vehicle for that. If you're praying for these people, God will be like, all right, fine. You want that? Boom. This is a gift I want to give everybody. So it's going to happen. So if you don't want to share your faith for whatever reason, don't do that. I'm warning you right now. Don't do it. As soon as I started praying that prayer, like, I'll give you an example. The plumber came to my house two weeks ago, and he heard my story, part of it. Why? He asked the question. What not me. But I started praying, God, give me a chance to share my stories with people. And boom, this guy shows up, and he asks me all these questions. So there you go. It's going to happen. Last thing. As you're thinking about this, I left... Um, a worksheet on each of the stations where you can go and get communion today. It's got a three column worksheet thing with questions for you that'll help you formulate your story. And so when you go get the elements, the, the, the juice and the bread, you can take one and if you have a pen, there's one in your seat. Um, you can begin even to jot down your ideas now while they're fresh in your mind during the reflection time right after I get finished speaking. And then take it home and flesh it out and share it with somebody. I, I'm confident that God will use you because he wants to, and your story is special. Let me pray for you. Father in heaven, thank you for this group. Thank you for bringing every person who's here. Lord, I'd like to pray first for the people who don't know you, who know they don't know you, and are here just thinking about what the weird story I just told. Um, I just pray for them, that you would meet them in a special way right now, um, that you reveal yourself to them in your love and your greatness and your compassion and that you would lead them towards yourselves. For the rest of us, Lord, who do know you, there's some of us who are reticent to tell our stories because we think it's not good, or we're reticent to tell because we don't know how our, our friends and relatives will re- or coworkers will, inter- will react. And Lord, I just pray for them and for me that you would give us confidence in you because if we just share, you do the work. And I pray you would use us as your tools and let us see you work for your glory and for our that in Jesus' precious name.